Good morning, everyone. Welcome as you gather with us today. Um, I, I chose a few songs for today, and as I was just going through them and um, preparing for today, I realised that they were all about blessing, um, about being blessed, and especially about blessing God. So let's stand together and sing as we bless God with our songs of worship. Thank you. 
ourselves to you afresh today. And we say thank you, Lord, for your love, for your blessing, for the way you care for us, for the way you provide for us. We thank you, Lord. You are a wonderful God. Amen. I wanted to, to bring to you a bit of an update on our Hands at Work involvement. And um, there's, there's a few things happening that... Uh, that are ex exciting about what's going on. So you know that um, in September last year, uh, a team went from here, or some people were from here, and um, we went to visit Tikluth in South Africa. So uh, the next slide will show you where they were meeting. So if you can see that. So that building there was um, a little bit in disrepair and very small and it, and it was the place where they were meeting to care for the children and um, provide for them. And then um, at the same time they were building a new building that would be um, their new care point, the one that they could own, not just a borrowed one, and where they could provide for the children in, in a way where the children could meet inside uh, when the weather was not good, um, they had good toilet facilities and so forth. So um, moving on from there, uh, we had a, a team member who was with us last year who, who saw these children and just got a burden on her heart that some of them didn't have shoes and some had shoes that were very worn. And, and she made a plea could we do something about this? And when our team trip was over and we did all our financials, we discovered that we had some surplus funds. And so we asked if we could put those surplus funds towards um, some shoes and clothing for the children. And you, you can also see behind there, that's the care point that's finished and they're using. So, so that was a wonderful outcome. And just recently, those children at Tcluf received those gifts from us so that's pretty special blessing and there was also some to be given at Somerset and I believe that was to happen this week just gone so um, yeah that, that was wonderful and uh, their response was that um, it's great to get these right now as the weather is cooling and um, they're finding that it's you know harder for the children to manage I just wanted to also read a little bit of an update about um, T. Kluth that, that you will have on your seats actually. Uh, if you don't have a copy, there are the spares down the back. But um, it says, T. Kluth community have identified 38 of the most vulnerable children they feel called to be caring for and have been trying to faithfully live out this mandate to care since they commenced the three essential services. However, they've come across a bit of a challenge. A number of the children are reliant upon being able to catch the school bus to attend the care point, as the distance for them to walk is very far. Unfortunately, the school bus has stopped running towards the end of last year. This has meant that these children are unable to regularly attend the care point. The care workers do not want to remove these children from their register because they still believe that they are most vulnerable and they are called to care for them and they are hopeful that the school bus will start running again soon. The Hands at Work Service Centre and Regional Support Team are monitoring the situation closely. Please join us in praying that the bus will be reinstated so these children can have access to these life-giving services. Additionally, earlier this month, the Vision Casting Day was held in Tcluf to dream with the CBO on how to better care to care for the six to 12 year olds at the care point. We would also appreciate your prayers as the care workers catch the vision, vision and new initiatives are implemented to better care for the six to 12 year old children. So there's great need there. And you can see a list here of, of the care workers. There are five of them who are faithfully committed to, to those children no matter what. They go after them, they advocate for them, they care for them as best they can. And I've also got a list of the children and I don't expect you, you might not even be able to read all of those names, but I just want you to know that each one is known by name, cared for 
and looked after. So I'd actually like us to stop now and pray together for, for the needs of the Tea Cliff community, for those children who can't get there. And if they can't get to the care point, it's not that they have another means of managing, they actually go without food and care. That's very confronting when you think about that. We also, um, you will know that because we only have 38 children in the, in the care point at Teakloof, that we've taken on a new community. And we've been trying to get our names around, uh, our tongues around the name of the new community, which we believed was Malabatini. And just this, uh, about 10 days ago, Rachel received a message from them um, to, with, uh, I'll just read the message out to you. Um, there has been some confusion with the names of the two new community hands will begin near our Papanyani care point. Um, some of you may know there were two communities they were looking at and we understood that Malabatini was the one allocated to us. The first community hands will begin in is called Spovini and this is the one that SBC will partner with. So if you were having trouble trying to get your tongue around the name, this one should be a bit easier for us. Um, Malabatini is the second new area that was mentioned and hands are hoping to start there too, but that will come later. Um, they were looking to bring the start date forward from October to August. We had been saying October, but they're, they're now saying that with the preparation and training required, Hans has made the decision to still start in October, despite the fact that the need is urgent, but they want to do their preparation well. Um, so they'll be beginning some training at the end of this month and they will have Maranatha workshops for the care workers coming up. So that's kind of exciting. There's some photographs, you can just sort of scroll through those of, of them doing their preparation. And um, we also have a video that um, was done by Prague and she is one of the African leaders. And there's just a little snippet from this, from a longer video, but just telling you how it's coming together. So you will know that Hands at Work goes into an area where no help is being offered and where the children are most vulnerable and they find and start to work with the local churches. But this is something that's happened a little bit differently and it's quite exciting. So it, it's about four or five minutes long, but I hope that you'll be able to tune in and watch this. The following day, we, uh, we had to go also now to the new community, but how we did it is we went to the pastors. This is very important uh, as, as we are expanding. I know most of you, you know, we go through the, the community leaders and the pastors and in Poponia and the pastors, really, they are really stepping out and to do their mandate to care for the children. Whatever they have, they do it. If it is the voice they need to give, they give the voice. They fight for the children there. So this pastor, uh, Daniel, he communicated to our Induna to introduce us to that community that where we are going. So in the morning, we had to meet first the secretary of the Induna. So we went and pick him. His name is Lamin. So we went and pick him. And to our surprise, we were so shocked. We find the whole community, the ladies, the, the community leaders, they are waiting for us. It was very shocking, you know, for us, we just went there just to walk. We never prepared a speech or anything, <laughs> but God was really surprising. And he taught us to say, you know what? You need to be ready in all season. So we looked at each other. We saw these lot of people. And then we looked at each other to say, what are we gonna say? What, what is happening, God? You know how you ask God? And God just say, wait, I've got this. And we meet these pastors and the, I mean, the community um, leaders and the community women, they all came. And to our surprise, the, the secretary from the Induna, 
He was the one who started sharing our vision. We were so shocked to say, where the heck, where did he get all this information? But he shared so well in a, such a way that the community people, they said, we have started already as we, we have built a small shack where if God blesses us, we feed our children who are most vulnerable. We know we have, we are prepared. It's like people were prepared. God made them to prepare for us in advance. So we, we went and see the, the shack that they have built and they, con they, they, they contributed even the ports. They have ports there. And in the following morning, we said, we are coming for, we want to walk in the community. Yes, we have seen, we, we've had the vision, but we want also to walk in the community. So they said, this is not the only community that you're going to go. There's another community they are waiting for you. Then I said, oh, okay. So we had to go again, take this, uh, the secretary, and we drove again to other communities. So I think it's about three kilometers apart from this new community, the one that we just from. So we went today, yo, again, we find the whole village people were there. Then we say, God, what are you doing? <laughs> and they, again, the secretary share the vision. So now both communities, they start fighting to say, no, please start with us. This community is most vulnerable. We need people. We've been waiting. We've been praying, crying to God to say, God, when are you going to send people? And they have heard about our, our care points that we have in other communities that the things that is do, we are doing and things like that. So we said, yo, God, what are we going to do this? Because the community is ready. It's like the, the, the scripture came to fulfill to say, the field is ready and the laborers are few. That's how we felt to say, we, we felt so small uh, when we see this happening in this community. But uh, we, we said, okay, tomorrow we'll try to work with the first community. And then if we don't manage, then the service center can continue and going forward to work in another community. So then we ask on the way back, we ask the secretary to say, maybe you can advise us because this is your community. Which community you think we can start? And he was so wise. He said, you know what? I don't know because both communities, they are vulnerable. Maybe you guys, we can start like A and B because they are vulnerable in all the community and they are ready to do whatever we ask them. They are ready to start caring for the children. What an encouragement that is to say a community is ready and waiting for them to come. What a blessing. Uh, let me just pray. Lord, we just thank you that you have gone before, that you have made a way, and that already the community is standing up and saying, we want to participate in caring for these children. And it's an exciting way for them to start, Lord, to have the community already engaged and, and welcoming them even before they start. So thank you, Lord, and thank you for our involvement here at Sunbury Baptist, and we pray that that we will be a blessing and an encouragement to them as they go forward and do this preparation over the next few months. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You'll also know that there's a great um, deal of famine in Africa at the moment. Their crops have failed. And Rachel wants to just give a bit more of an update on that. Yeah, no, I just, I know that Paul said bit last year toward the end of the year that there was communities that are starting to suffer with drought and of course that's actually increased and we've probably heard a little bit about that on the news um, in the last months. Um, the countries that are mainly affected that we're working in, we're working in eight countries in Africa, hands at work that is, and then so the main countries that are affected would be Mozambique, Zimbabwe and parts of Zambia. Um, you may have seen in March or late Feb that uh, Zambia um, declared a state of emergency because of the drought, request, requesting assistance, and also Zimbabwe in April also. Um, so it's a pretty dire situation. Um, 
in most of these communities um, that are, you know, that are able to um, have gardens, um, these vulnerable, most vulnerable communities rely on subsistence farming. So that's what the primary way that the people survive. Um, so they grow maize, which is like a corn, um, and it's a staple food in our African countries. Um, they also grow vegetables, of course. Um, and when they harvest those, they either sell them um, so that they can provide for their families or they use the uh, crops or the harvest for uh, their own families. So what we've found is because the rain has been so inconsistent, um, you know, they have been unable to grow properly. And so it's forced these families now um, into like a hunger season, like an extended hunger season. Um, so we know as hands at work that we need to actually intervene, you know, just provide some intervention so that these families will um, manage this period where the food is so scarce. So I thought, you know, you know, it, for us, we don't really understand hunger season because it's not, you know, it's not something that we really experience heavily here. Um, but hunger season is the period of time from when last year's harvest runs out through to the next annual harvest being ready. So it's the most challenging time of the year for families in many of our communities. So in most of the communities in Southern Africa where we're working, um, they would have their dry season roughly in April to October and their wet season from November to March. So October, the land is prepared for planting, which occurs, you know, between, you know, November to mid-December, depending on the seed that they're planting. Um, and, and also dependent on when the rains begin, you know, we've got our watering systems and irrigation here, but they don't have that available there. Um, and then harvest is any, any time between April to June. Um, so for a successful harvest, the rainfall needs to be steady and consistent in the rainy season. And over recent years, this has really been unpredictable um, with extreme weather patterns that we've seen. Um, and families also face challenges accessing seed and fertiliser because they are so poor. Um, and so all of these things are contributing just to poorer harvest for our families. Um, there is a handout that I've put there uh, that's got a little bit about the, it's really um, interesting to read actually, that's got a little bit about the um, farming seasons in Zambia, which is very similar actually to across most of our Southern African countries. Um, so now with this severe drought that um, is affecting our communities, being the most vulnerable, um, HANDS have done a detailed assessment of each of our communities. Um, and just to work out, you know, which, which communities we need to intervene in. And then when we work those ones out, we also work out which families are the most vulnerable within those communities. So we've kind of done it on a, or they've done it on a, like a traffic light, um, you know, categorised it traffic light wise. So we've, tr it's, so the category of green means that they've had a strong harvest, which we're very grateful for. If it's orange, they've had like a normal harvest, but if it is red, these communities crops have failed um, and they do require us to intervene. So there's over 60% of the hands communities that are in that situation of red. So over the coming months, um, hands will need, you know, just to provide immediate food support in those red communities to the most vulnerable within those. Um, and, um, they might need to be putting into place like daily feeding for our primary caregivers as well as our children. Um, and there are regions also, the ones that are most badly affected, it, it appears at this stage is in the Zambia region of Chizamba and Kabwe. Um, and so they will need to be um, cared for there. So the second phase that HANDS will bring in um, would be to provide seed and fertiliser for the next planting season, which remembering is like October time. Um, and so with HANDS, we're always considering the best ways to respond to these crises, because there's many crises in Africa, um, and just how to equip and empower our families there and communities with longer term solutions. But we do understand that in this situation, it's really urgent just to provide that food support over the coming months. 
So just in light of all of that, um, when we estimate sort of what um, the costs will be to intervene um, to, to help these families, we're looking at around about 70,000 uh, Australian dollars across the, you know, all of those communities that are affected in the red. So in Australia, we care, for, so with the communities that Hands Australia support, um, there are six communities that are affected in the red. And we're just trusting that God would provide, that, that he would raise up and provide around $13,000 to cover those six communities. So it's looking at about 2,200 per community, um, just to provide that food relief um, and the seeds and the fertiliser. And also we know there will be other measures that will have to be put into place to help them to survive through this drought. So I guess, you know, we would really appreciate your prayers at the moment for, um, you know, for the families that are affected. Um, it's, it's just really a vulnerable season for them. And also if you could just pray for hands, uh, wisdom for hands, just that God would guide and direct and just give them the discernment on how to assist them um, in the best way. Um, so there is a hand out there. If, if, if anyone would like to give toward that, there's information on there that you can um, also use as well. So thanks for that. Thanks for just allowing me just to share a little bit on what's currently happening on the ground in Africa. Jesus Christ. I'm reading 2 Peter chapter 1. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have received a faith 
as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's great to be here this morning. Thank you for your warm welcome. I uh, look forward to catching up with others of you uh, over lunch. Uh, just to let you know, I was uh, uh, Senior Pastor of Waverley Baptist for uh, many years before I retired a couple of years ago. Um, prior to that, I was the State Director for Global Missions for the Baptist Union and what is now Baptist Mission Australia. So I have been here before, uh, about 22 years ago, representing the Baptist Mission and uh, also uh, around Victoria. But uh, it's great to be back here this morning uh, and filling in for Paul. Uh, I've known Paul and Dawn for uh, many, many years, nearly 30 years, and also Paul's uh, mum and dad were members of my church at uh, Waverley Baptist and Shirley still is. Unfortunately, she wanted to come this morning but uh, uh, had a, a health incident during the week and uh, is, is not really up to coming. So uh, couldn't come, come with us. But it is, it is great to be here. Yep. Okay, tucked away at the end of the New Testament are some letters from Jesus' brother, James and Jude, the two brothers, and the apostles who knew Jesus, Peter and John. This letter that we uh, had read to us this morning was written by a person who clearly claims to be Simon Peter, the apostle who knew Jesus and who was with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, about 30 years had passed since the resurrection. And in that time, the message had spread widely, even to Rome, the, the centre of the empire. But in that time also, heresies were creeping into the church. Some leaders had gone off the rails. Persecution is looming. Peter is about to face death. And so he, he writes to the believers of his concerns. He writes firstly in this letter of the great foundation for the Christian. He says in verses 3 and 4, His divine power 
has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through him, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Notice what he says. God has given us everything we need. Not everything we want, but everything we need for a godly life. Believer, you have everything you need to live for God. It's all there. God has given it to you. Now, these are great and precious promises, we're told. And as we grow in Christ, we are participating in God's very nature. And that's what Christian growth really is. Becoming more like God. Letting his spirit change us into the people he created us to be. So, we escape the corruption of the world. Corruption that we can look out and see on display all around us. We can see it every day, every week, if, if we look, can't we? Secondly, he comes and he, he tells us about the basic attitude. So first of all, the foundation. Next, the basic attitude the Christian is to assume. Peter's assuming and teaching that the basic aim of the Christian is to escape this world's corruption and he goes on to say in verse 10, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. As believers, we are called by God to make every effort to confirm that calling. We are to work never to stumble on the path of life. And if we do that, the end is secure. We receive, we're told, that rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So, is that your basic attitude? Between these two statements at the beginning and end of the foundation and the aim, attitude and end for the Christian. Between those two, though, Peter shares a list of the things that are important in discipleship. I call it the stairway to heaven. Many people climb stairways, of course. Sometimes in the workplace, we... Uh, we use it disparagingly. We call a person a bit of a climber if they're climbing over others to try to get to the top. But often in life, the stairways people climb are stairways to nowhere. I don't know whether any of you have ever read that uh, wonderful little children's book, Hope for the Flowers, which uh, it, it's, it's a parable. And in the story, there are these caterpillars who are climbing and they're climbing to the top. And uh, they're all piling. I don't know, have you ever seen those piles of caterpillars? Well, th this is a great little story about it. They're all climbing and climbing. And as the key character gets further and further up, he looks out across the plane and he sees all these caterpillars all piled up on, on top of one another. And, and so there are lots of caterpillar pillars. And he climbs and he climbs and he has to tread on other caterpillars and tread on them. And he gets right up near the top and he looks up so he can see the top and he says, hey, there's nothing there. All of that climbing and there's nothing there. And one who's a bit further up says, shh, shut up. We are where they want to be. It's a parable about life. Hope for the flowers. Have a look out for it so, sometime if you've never read it. Uh, it's not worth climbing that sort, of, uh, that sort of stairway. Led Zeppelin had a famous song called Stairway to Heaven. That's about a lady who put her faith in gold that glitters 
and tries to buy a stairway to heaven. But this stairway that Peter mentions is not a stairway that can be bought. It is given by God. It is God's pathway to growth for the Christian. The bottom rung is faith. Trust in God. Believing. Commitment. We always, when I was in youth group many years ago, I used to talk about a person making a commitment. It was our, our shorthand for uh, becoming a Christian, making a commitment. It, it also means allegiance. Americans constantly pledge allegiance to the flag. We Christians pledge allegiance every day to the cross and to Jesus, our Saviour. We enter the Christian path by faith. As Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We don't earn it. We don't buy it with our actions. The price was paid for us by Jesus on the cross. We have to simply grasp hold of what he has done for us. We trust him. We yield ourselves to him. We commit ourselves, our whole being, to him in faith. We place ourselves under him as our Lord, our master, as our Aboriginal brothers and sisters call it, our boss man. We pledge allegiance to the one who gave up his sinless life in our place. That's the first rung, faith. Trust. Have you stepped on the stairway? That invitation is available to all to come into the heavenly kingdom won by our Lord and Saviour Jesus. It's offered to all who will trust him, who will place their faith in Jesus, not in the values and structures and stuff of this corrupted world. Faith is the foundation. Faith opens the door of the kingdom. But we don't stay with just faith. We don't stay as baby believers. God wants us to grow, to change us. And that change is represented by this stairway. He says, add to your faith goodness. Now, the New International Version translates this word goodness. And just reading the NIV, we might think that he's saying add good works to your faith. After all, Ephesians 2.10 does go on to say, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But the word here underlying this translation of goodness really means excellence. And the New Living Translation captures the meaning a bit better when it says, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Some other translations use the term virtue or excellence of character. So Peter is saying that once you believe, once you come to faith in Jesus, you ought to be aiming high in your morals and character. He's saying be diligent. Be aware and turn away from the corruptions of this world. Make an effort. An athlete must practice and exercise to be competitive. We've been watching, some of you I'm sure have watched their swimming trials for the Olympics over the last, the last week. Those athletes put so much effort into, into their swimming. We as Christians are called to put effort into our discipleship. The Christian needs diligence and effort to grow. Lying, stealing, sexual immorality, racism, prejudice, jumping to conclusions about people, gossip. They're just a few of the moral spheres the Christian is urged to turn away from and reject. We're to aim for what is good and turn aside 
from evil. In this sense, Christians are goody goodies. And that's no insult. Because goodness, moral excellence, makes the world a better place. Certainly, a society where moral excellence is upheld and aimed for, we're not going to be perfect, we know that, but any society where, where that is aimed for is a much better place to live where corrupt than where it is where corruption rules. Add to your goodness, he says, knowledge. Knowing God. Knowing by the Bible, that's the next step. Knowing what is good and wise. This word means insight. Seeing the consequences of one's actions. Making good choices. Choices that are best for all. You can't grow without knowledge. And that's why we come and we listen to sermons and we have Bible studies e each week. That knowledge, that understanding is really important. But remember, the knowing is not just head knowledge. It's the knowledge of experience. You grow in the knowledge of God as you exercise faith, as you choose what is morally excellent and puts God's values first in your life. Next, we add self-control. We need to learn how to control our passions and desires. Because if we allow our passions and desires to control us, then the corrupted ones will destroy us and our relationships. Our world says, indulge yourself. Express yourself. Follow your whims. If it feels good, do it. God says, control yourself. Do what is good and right and healthy and loving. And outside of that, control yourself. How much damage is wrought by the lack of self-control? Anger, violence, adultery and family breakdown, the damage of the precious lives of children. It's all around us. We, we see the heartbreaking consequences of lack of self-control and sometimes the world just applauds and uses it as entertainment Peter teaches us and calls us to exercise self-control and then to that we must add perseverance we are called to persevere in doing good in following the right when everyone is compromising. Sticking to Jesus. It is hard to do what is right when everyone around you is doing wrong. But cling to Jesus. Cling to his ways. Stick at it. It's worth it in the end. Too many Christians sadly fail to persevere. Their witness is damaged and their lives fail to bring glory to God through lack of perseverance. Even in the simple perseverance, like joining together as a family of God on a regular basis for worship, some have given up. After COVID, many failed to return to corporate worship when churches opened up again. Now, streaming was a great boon in the pandemic. It helped us out a lot and it can be useful even, even now when we can't make it. But being with believers is critical for this stairway God wants us to climb. Persevere in this and every other aspect of faith and obedience. So we come to the last few that lift us into God's plan for our lives. As you persevere, it says add godliness, God-likeness. It means being like God in character, having God's values and attitudes. 
following God's ways of grace and forgiveness, service and sacrifice. It is godliness that has led people to start charities, to found hospitals, to welcome refugees and to challenge evil. Soak yourself in God, in the character of God and allow his spirit to make God's virtues your character. The next step is mutual affection. The word here is Philadelphia, brotherly love. Christian believers are brothers and sisters in Christ. We form an eternal family. You know, that eternal family will outlast our biological families. Biological families are important. There's no doubt about that. They're part of God's plan for human existence. But whether our biological families move with us into eternity or not depends on the faith of the individuals but our brothers and sisters in Christ will stand with us before the throne of God and will be together with us in eternity we are to love one another as we follow Jesus together and it was that love that was the the mark of the Christian in the early church that won over thousands as pagans looked and commented see how they love one another it is kindness consideration caring helping it's putting others first we need more of it as we demonstrate God's love in his church. By this, Jesus said, shall everyone know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do the people of Sunbury coming in and looking at this fellowship, do they know that you are his disciples because of the love you show for one another? And then the final step on the stairway is, in fact, this word love. Here the word is agape, that special Christian sacrificial love that gives without regard to reward, that expresses the love of God that devised the plan of salvation the love which led Jesus, who didn't have to, to go to the cross and die for each one of us. To die for your sins and for mine. This love does not require recompense. It simply does what is best for the other. This is the love that changes the world. And it's the pinnacle of what God's spirit is trying to produce in us so this morning we have just considered something of the true stairway to heaven are you climbing it I know you may be a Christian but are you growing in Christ where are you on this stairway to heaven let's go back have you jumped onto the bottom step have you placed your faith in the Lord and embraced Jesus, committing your life to the one who loved you enough to die for you? The invitation is open to everyone. If you haven't, you can. Don't go home today without receiving Jesus as your Saviour and yielding to him as your Lord. But if you have faith, how are you pursuing excellence, the goodness, of this passage how are you adding knowledge and developing self-control persevering in your faith and aiming for godliness brotherly love and agape sacrificial love how are these things being expressed in your discipleship journey 
as Peter goes on to say, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Following this word will make you an effective and productive Christian, helping you to be the person God created you to be. It will bring glory to him with the life that he's given you and the life that he's bought on the cross. It will also, of course, be a blessing to all of those around you if you climb this stairway to heaven. What a great passage it is there in the start of this letter of Peter. May God enable us to hear it and put it into practice for our blessing, but also for his glory. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, David, for sharing that message with us today. I hope that it touched each one of our hearts. Thank you.